Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, February 6, 2014. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby from BeerAndWineJournal.com joins me to talk about scaling homebrew batches. If you want to brew more or less of a recipe, what's the best way to go about it? If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, BasicBrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is BasicBrewing, all one word. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. Our show page on Facebook is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on Google Plus, too. Thanks again to everybody who is clicking on the amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. You know how it works whenever you think of Amazon shopping. Go, don't go directly to Amazon. Go to basicbrewing.com. Click on our Amazon ad there on the right-hand side of the page. That will take you to Amazon. You can shop as you wish. You won't even notice in the, the price or anything, and you'll be helping us to bring you this show. We greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes and our Android app on Amazon.com. We're on the BlackBerry Podcast Directory. We're on the Stitcher app. We're on the Windows Phone Directory. We're just everywhere. Check out our Brewer's Logbook at basicbrewingshop.com. In the front is a blank calendar that you can use to track your fermentations and plan your brews. There's room in the back to log the details of up to 50 batches of brew. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. Thanks greatly to everybody who has done so already. And uh, you can protect your precious beer with one of our growler bags. Check those out at basicbrewingshop.com. I got an interesting letter, uh, email from from Pat. Don't know where Pat is, but Pat says, uh, my wife, who came from a non-beer, non-alcoholic beverage consuming family, now enjoys wine and loves tasty beer. Hooray, Pat says. She's given me the okay to start a home brewery in our basement. As soon as I finish ripping out all the paneling, fixing the drywall, fixing the drywall, fixing I messed up, <laughs> painting the walls, ripping out the carpet, putting down hardwood floors and finishing the floors, and putting up crown molding and baseboards. My goodness. Uh, as Pat says, I so I have a little while to save up for the brewery. I typically try to research as much as I can about a hobby and then buy all the upgrades I would want for a hobby instead of buying starter kits, etc., and then buying the upgrades. So if you were starting out again and didn't want to waste money replacing starter supplies with upgrades, what would you buy right off the get-go? Or is there a starter kit that has these upgrades? Well, I thought that was a fun question to think about. Uh, so I put it out there on our Facebook.com slash Basic Brewing page to get your input. And so far, we've gotten a lot of great thoughts from you all out there. Uh, I posted a, a comment myself and on that thread, and then it mysteriously disappeared not long after I put it up. Weird. Um, anyway, what I, what I said in, the, in that uh, ill-fated comment was that uh, if I had it to do all over again, I'd, I'd start off with a bigger brew pot. And uh, a stronger heat source, like a propane burner, so that I could go to uh, full volume boils right away. But uh, I'd love to hear what you think. Go to facebook.com slash basicbrewing and weigh in. And uh, it is great that Pat has spousal support for the project. I did, reading it this just now, reading that email, uh, he, Pat says, uh, finishing the floors making hardwood floors and that you know if you've got a if you've got a basement and you you're putting hardwood floors down there you might want to around the home brewery area you might want to do something like tile or linoleum or or something like that where um, it would be easier cleanup and so you wouldn't have to be worrying about spilling stuff on the hardwood floors uh, but that's just just me anyway go to facebook.com slash basic brewing and weigh in uh, on Pat's question. I racked my easy-peasy Pilsner into a secondary and put it into my kegerator for cold conditioning this week. Um, my hydrometer sample tasted very promising. It wasn't buttery or butterscotchy, so I guess my uh, diacetyl rest worked. I'll have more details on that process on an upcoming Basic Brewing video episode. 
I don't do many loggers, and you know, whenever I do one, I remember why because I'm just I'm not a very patient guy. Uh, in addition to the challenges of fermenting at cooler temperatures, uh, which was solved by the the cold temperatures in my basement uh, this this winter, ales just turn around so much more quickly. Uh, however, I'm hoping that there will be a tasty payoff to all the waiting, and so far, so good. I get a lot of email from listeners who want to scale batches, uh, mostly scale batches down to small batch recipes. Uh, but, you know, people also want to scale recipes up. And uh, whenever you do that, there are, are equipment uh, requirements and equipment challenges uh, to do so, in addition to just scaling the recipe itself. And when I saw Chris Colby's series of articles on this very subject on beerandwinejournal.com, I said that would be a fun thing to talk about. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. Did you see the Super Bowl this past weekend? Uh, yeah. Was that on? <laughs> <laughs> now we know from uh, 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 American music hero Bob Dylan that we're supposed to let the Germans brew our beer now. <laughs> And uh, apparently our, uh, we're supposed to let the Italians own our car companies, too. So is there something more American than America? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good question, Bob. Go back to your museum case. <laughs> Want to buy some Mendes, Bob? <laughs> Want to buy some Mendes, Bob? <laughs> so I was a, to show you how fun of a dad I am, I was sitting with my 16-year-old son, and we were watching the Super Bowl, and I said, now these ads – Watch these ads and see if they actually ta say anything about the qualities or characteristics of the products themselves, or if it's just a bunch of uh, ad, you know advertising fluff and and BS. And sure enough, you know there on comes the uh, the Budweiser commercial with the puppy and the and the horse, and uh, <laughs> and then there's the Bud Light commercial that's colder than cold, and then you see Don Cheadle in the elevator with a llama. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what's this got to do with a beer? And uh, I'm thinking what they may be doing is, is trying to kind of um, uh, put in a new stand-in for the uh, mascot for uh, Delirium Trimmins. You know, it used to be the uh, the pink elephant. Now I guess it's going to be Don Cheadle in the elevator with the llama. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's uh, I always get a kick out of all the ads and, and how they say nothing and and then they stick a picture of a soldier in there to make you f feel good about the country, and and then you go out and buy their buy their product. For buy their product for Murica. Murica, but that's not why we're here. That's just a that's just a pointless rant. Are uh, we here to talk about the uh, Denver's defense? <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, I've mentioned something that doesn't exist. Oh, <laughs> silly me. Yeah, we had listeners in De in Denver. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't take sides. I didn't take sides in the game. I just, uh, I just watched it to snark at the uh, at the commercials and the halftime show. Um, but uh, I, I, I was anticipating the uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, wardrobe mal uh, malfunction would have been worse than Janet Jackson's, but that didn't happen. So, uh, I anticipated them coming out wearing socks, or or should I say a sock a piece, just like in the old days, but that didn't happen. I would think their walkers would have knocked the stocks off, though. So <laughs> they just come out wearing a tennis ball, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like on the end of those walker legs. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but that is neither here nor there. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is another series of articles that you wrote in beer in uh, beerandwinejournal dot com. This one on a topic that I get questions fairly frequently, and that is about scaling homebrew batches and scaling homebrew recipes up or down. And so, you know, when I first started homebrewing, five gallons was what you brewed. I mean, that was just the American standard of, of what you brewed as far as when you made homebrew, and that was you brewed five gallons. And when I discovered that people were brewing more than that at a time, or uh, when I started brewing much smaller amounts uh, than that back in 2005, 2006. Uh, that was kind of a, releva a revelation or a, or a relevation, whichever, whichever one you uh, want to choose. Uh, so, so first of all, talk about scale. I mean, what, what does that mean to home brewers and, and uh, what are the kind of factors that we want to look at when we're scaling up or down? 
Yeah, well, um, five-gallon batches have for a long time now been sort of the de-, de facto standard size, and that's largely because of uh, there's a variety of, of equipment out there that we all use that have been sort of co-opted from other uses. You know, the the five-gallon, uh, you know, soda keg being probably the most obvious, and also, uh, you know, uh, five and six and uh, six and a half gallon carboys, which you know were originally for water. Um, uh, so the the size is uh, sort of an artifact of what homebrewers could adapt to. And also, it was an amount that people felt comfortable making. You put in, you know, you put in your brew day, uh, let the beer ferment, and when you packaged it, you had about you know two cases of twelve ounce bottles, a little over that. And so, you know, people felt pretty good about, uh, you know, yeah, I spent this time, but now I got two cases of beer. Um, but yeah, eventually, you know, a, a lot of people realized, you know, some people realized, well, I can find bigger pots out there, and you know, I can split the batch into two carboys and, you know, I can make twice as much beer in the same amount of time because it really, you know, making 10 gallons of beer doesn't really, um, I mean, it depends on your equipment and, and some, some details, but basically if you're set up for it, brewing 10 gallons of beer or 15 or 20, it doesn't take any more time than it does to, to brew five. And so some people have thought, you know, yeah, well, I'm going to, going to scale up and make more beer. Yeah. Other people, you know, they may get to the point brewing five gallons where they've got, you know, their kegerator is full of kegs. And, you know, when they brew a new one, maybe they have to pull one that's almost done out or, you know, kill a keg. And they realize, hey, I'm, I'm just stacking up all this beer, you know, either that or they live in an apartment with limited space. And they think, hey, I don't need to brew a full five gallons every time. You know, I if, if I'm brewing this often that I'm, you know, either generating more beer than I can use or. You know, my entire apartment is uh, filled to the brim with brewing equipment and I've got no room for anything else. You can scale down to, to fit your situation. Well, let's start talking about equipment uh, and let's go let's go bigger first, uh, because that's probably where most people go uh, in the beginning. You know, when they start off with five gallons or 19 liters, uh, they probably want to start going bigger. Uh, so there's there's some equipment challenges first of all that that you've got to uh that you got to get into like for instance if you're if you're brewing five gallons where you, especially if you're doing split batches and only boiling half of it at a time you can probably get away with brewing on the on the kitchen stove but when you're starting to brew you know if you're starting with a, a starting volume of your boil at 12 gallons now you know, to compensate for your boil off to get 10 gallons. Now that the kitchen stove is going to be out of the question. So what kind of equipment are we, are we looking at? Yeah. Finding um, a bigger brew kettle is, is one of the challenges to scaling up. Uh, Fortunately for, for most people, it's, it's pretty easy to meet. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of home brewers when they, when they first jump to doing a full work boil or a bigger or boiling more, get uh you know one of those standard uh turkey fryer setups which is a you know propane burner and uh, a lot of times they come with like a seven gallon pot but you can easily easily find larger pots um and of course as brewers one of the sort of popular pot options is a a, a converted sankey keg you know 15 and a half gallon uh you know half keg um and you know at this point i should say make sure that you're not Stealing those from breweries, uh, yeah. they're fine. There are legally, you know, once the breweries have decommissioned because they can't use it anymore, uh, different uh, companies like Sabco sell those. Uh, so don't just steal a keg from a local brewery and do that. Yeah, it's a big but problem. It is, and it costs it costs breweries a lot of money actually, and it, it hurts the smaller ones disproportionately because they don't have the huge amount of funds to, uh, you know, to buy kegs like the the bigger. Not that. That, that that makes it okay to do against the bigger guys and still steal it. <laughs> but it's just if you like craft beer and smaller beer, the you know, you're hurting the the very brewers that you, you enjoy. So that but disclaimer anyway, out of the way. Uh that disclaimer <laughs> out of the way. Yeah, if you can find a legal one, um, which a lot of places sell, uh you yeah, that makes a nice uh that makes a nice keg. Plus uh if 
uh, you have a restaurant supply store in your town, you know, those are a great, uh, a great place to look for, you know, the, a lot of them will carry used equipment because, you know, restaurants are constantly going out of business and selling stuff and you can find some stuff cheap. I even, uh, one time I was at a camping store and they had a 20 gallon aluminum pot for like a hundred bucks, which is like insane. And I was like, all right. So I got a, I have a 20 gallon aluminum pot now that I, I can use. You might want to look at army surplus stores as well. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of places you can look to find bigger brew kettles and to heat them. Uh, you know, any of the standard, uh, propane burners will work pretty good. You do want to make sure the bigger and bigger you scale up the, the taller propane burners with the more flimsy legs, you want to start avoiding those. There are some that are more, more, more squat and have a, uh, uh, thicker legs. Like I've got one that's like, uh, stainless steel and, and it'll hold a lot of weight because if you're, you know, if you're boiling 15 gallons, that's mm. 20 pounds, 20, uh, whatever, 8.6 pounds per <laughs> gallon times 15. Yeah. <laughs> So in talking about weight and talking about volume, <clears throat> you know, if you if you're brewing 5 gallons, you can get away with say, you know, pour, boiling or or heating up your sparge water and say picking up a pot and pouring it into your your mash tun. Uh but when you're brewing twice as much as that, then you start getting into the need for pumps and uh ways to mechanically move uh the the liquid from one place to another. Yeah, there's a point at which um, you're going to want, at a minimum, that all your vessels stay in, it's in one location. You, you can't be picking up, uh, or I mean, you, you could be, perhaps, if you were a weightlifter, but you know, picking up like a 15-gallon uh, pot full of hot water is, is going to be extremely difficult and, and not very safe. And so, yeah, there gets to be a point where you, you certainly at least want the uh, the vessels to stay put, and you can maybe... Uh, you know, you can take some pitchers or something and use it to scoop liquid from one to another. But eventually you're going to get to the point where you just want to pump to move things because that uh, – if, if you get one of those high-temperature food-grade pumps like the like the March pump that's very popular with home brewers, uh, that works well. And, you know, you just set it up and, uh, you know, barring having problems with priming it, uh, you know, you just move the liquid from, you know, either your hot liquor tank to your mash tun or your – you know, your mash tun to your kettle or, or whatever you're doing. You can you can set up a system like with a brewing sculpture type thing where you have you use gravity to move, say, your your hot water from your hot liquor tank down to the mash tun and then the the wort down from the mash tun to the to the brew kettle. Um but you know I guess those start to get taller and taller the more <laughs> the more volume you have. And uh, most people, when they do like a brewing setup, uh, they do something where uh, it's either what you have uh, in your in your uh, house, or something where they have all three vessels uh, on the same level, uh, and then move move the liquid around via a pump. Yeah, there, there's a few different arrangements. There's the side by side, and then there's one uh, like mine has the. Uh, the hot liquor tank is on the bottom and the mash tun's above it. So you pump liquid up there, but then it goes by gravity down into the kettle. Um, or there are some that are uh, sort of the, the, there's a central support post and all three kettles are, or all three vessels are aligned vertically. So, you know, all you got to do is uh, you have to get the hose up the, <laughs> to the top and, and get your water in there. But once, once you've got your hot liquor tank filled, it's all gravity gravity driven from there when uh when you've got a system like that um and it gets a bit more difficult to clean just because it's bigger uh do you start to move into uh cleaning strategies like using chemicals to do clean in place cip or or do you stick with the old-fashioned way i mean that's another factor that you've got to look at yeah, I think for most brewers, you know, especially at the 10, 15 gallon level, that would be overkill. I mean, that's not to say that people don't do it, but uh, you can uh, at 10 to 15 gallon breweries, you you pretty much can uh, once once the pots are empty, you can uh, you know just get in there and scrub them. If you uh, 
you know, if you start to go larger than that, yeah, a CIP or clean in place regimen might be starting to become more useful, especially because a lot of brewers who scale up sort of like to do things more like professional brewers do, mm-hmm. like 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 it to have more of a uh, commercial brewery feel to it. Some of them, at least, uh, and it's possible. Sure. What about fermenters? I mean, do do most guys or and gals who who scale up uh do they split the batch into into the same size fermenters that they've been using all along or there's all there's the also stepping up into the uh, like the conical fermenters you know that can hold all of the all of the wort at the same time right the the fermenters finding the fermenters that are are exactly the right volume uh that that's more of a problem when you scale up. A, a lot of people do just split between a couple carboys because it's a little bit more work, but it's not that big of a deal. And plus, if you have a like a converted chest freezer for fermenting something, you know the carboys will fit in there nicely. And then you just rack them to two, you know, five gallon corny kegs. And if you've got a homemade kegerator, it likely fits in there. Uh, but there are a couple options uh, if you want to ferment all in one. Uh, vessel. One is to buy a demijohn, which is sort of a, it's a big uh, sort of teardrop shaped glass vessel uh, that winemakers sometimes use. And uh, they, they're actually used for a lot of different things and they come in a lot of sizes, but uh, at home winemaking shops, there are 10 gallon and 15 gallon versions. So if you're making a 10 gallon batch, uh, the 15 gallon version works good because that gives you enough room for the croissant. Um, and they usually, uh, if you see them, they usually have like a little plastic sort of basket with handles that they come in. Uh, and those are, uh, those are not too, exp- they're more expensive than carboys. They're like in the neighborhood of a hundred bucks for the 15 gallon version. Um, and, and that's one option. Another option that people can consider is a food grade garbage can. Hmm. And this is another vessel that uh, home winemakers use a lot because they typically, you know, they make their uh, product once a year and they, and they make a large batch of it. And there's, uh, there's various ones. I've got two, the, the brute Rubbermaid uh, ones that are uh, the, our food grade. And you sort of got to, they, the thing is they're food grade, but they're not really designed for fermentation. So it's, it's sort of got to be up to you to, to, to read up on it and decide if you think that's safe. I mean, uh, lots of winemakers use it, but that doesn't mean that lots of winemakers aren't slowly poisoning themselves. Um, <laughs> Another disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've used it for beer and, and I did, you know, there was no flavor uh, to it. And uh, I don't know. I turned out like I did. I guess there's your warning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if if people are worried, they can listen to the uh, the first two episodes of, with our uh, our toxicologist uh, Paul, who talks a bit about uh, fermenting in plastic and and buying you know what to look out for in buying plastic, say at the hardware store to to ferment in. But the packaging, if you if you hate bottling uh, two cases of beer you're going to really hate bottling four cases of beer. So I think when people start stepping up, that's when you really see people get in, getting into kegging uh, and uh, packaging options like that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you're brewing 10 or 15 gallon batches, uh, putting it all in a, you know, 12 ounce bottle, this is going to be a lot of work. Um, you know, it's not, it's not to say that it can't be done, but that's, that's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of bottles to cap. Uh, and the obvious solution for a lot of people is to split the, the batch into two five-gallon carboy or corny kegs. Uh, you know, corny kegs are fairly, fairly cheap, fairly available still even, uh, although they're getting harder to find. Um, there are 10-gallon corny kegs that have been made. I've, I've actually got two, hmm. uh, but they're, they're hard to find and they're expensive when you do find them. But if you, if you brew 10-gallon batches a lot uh, – the nice thing about them is that they're uh, they're wider. They aren't like they aren't scaled up so that they're, they're taller as well. They're just wider, 
hmm. so that they'll they'll fit in um, a lot of they'll, or they'll fit in most homebrew uh, you know fermentation chambers and uh, dispensing chambers that are made for like more than one five gallon carboy. Um, so uh, that's the option uh, or that's an option, but you know basically for most guys who are brewing 10 or 15 gallons, it's, you know, two or three uh, corny kegs, five gallon size. So let's talk about, uh, are there any other, other high points uh, on, on the big side, going big side that we want to, that we want to look out for? On the big side, like the, the high points are, whether it's the obvious that you're yielding more beer from the same amount of work. Um, there's uh, at least one little incidental thing, and that's, the larger the size, if you go in all grain, the larger the size of your mash, the better it's going to hold the, the temperature steady just because mm. it's got less surface area proportionally to shed heat from. So you can, uh, I mean, and a lot of people have, in, in additionally, they, they have uh, ways to heat their, if, if at that scale, they have ways to heat their mash tun and hold the mash temperature. But just uh, insulating it, especially when you do beers with larger grain bills, uh you, you can hold the mash temperature steady for, for longer than you can at the five gallon scale, just because of the, the surface to volume ratio of your mash. Now let's talk about going small. This is, this is more in my ballpark. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a proponent of the small batches. Um, so when you are, I would say, <clears throat> I would contend that it, that it is easier to go small than it is to go big. Uh, just because there are more uh, equipment choices out there uh, for you. In fact, you you probably have the stuff already in your house uh, to brew smaller batches. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things that you can adapt to smaller scale brewing. And uh, when when you see people doing uh, smaller batch brewing on, on the internet, you'll notice that almost every setup is different. People mm-hmm. have you know hit on a. a a ton of different ways. Whereas for 10 or 15 gallon home brewers, there's, I mean, there's, there's certainly differences, but, uh, they're kind of channeled into, uh, you know, a few different, uh, varieties, you know, the three, like the three converted Sankey keg based thing or the thing with, uh, you know, maybe two converted Sankey kegs and a huge, uh, picnic cooler for the mash ton. Um, but at, at a smaller scale, you just, you see all, just all kinds of, uh, you know, weird setups, like my own personal weird setup is taking either a two or a three gallon, uh, beverage cooler, just the sort of cylindrical coolers with the spigot on the bottom that, you know, you would use for serving, you know, cold beverages, uh, just line those with a, uh, with a, like a steeping bag. You can put your crushed grains and use that for a mash ton and you don't, given the scale, you don't need to set up a manifold or anything because it really doesn't matter. And it, it doubly doesn't matter if you if you batch sparge it, um, but even even if you do uh, you know a sort of version of continuous sparging, uh, just the scale is such that you don't need to worry about you know making a, a complicated manifold. And what I've used a lot is just to use a a kettle on the stove to mash in, uh, because just as you said with the bigger batches with the bigger uh, mash volume, that's going to hold the temperature a lot longer. When you're only mashing, say, you know, maybe four pounds of grain inst- <laughs> instead of a uh, much a larger amount, uh, the mash temperature is going to fall. So ha- actually mashing in a kettle allows you to check the temperature halfway through the mash. And then as you're stirring the mash to keep from scorching it, you can add some heat to the bottom of that to, bring- to maintain your temperature or to bring your temperature back up. Um, and then for sparging, I mean, don't forget brewing a bag uh, is it, it'd be really way, easy way to do this. Uh, and also, uh, if people watch basic brewing video, they see us uh, sparge our one gallon batches just using a kind of a, a mesh colander uh, over the brew pot, uh, scooping the grain from the mash kettle in, in, into that colander over the brew pot uh, and then sparging that way. And it's really super easy. Um, and uh, as far, you know, in, you know, you, you, people, a lot of people say that they don't see why you would 
go to all the trouble to do a smaller batch because it takes the same amount of time as a 5 or a 10-gallon batch. I haven't timed this, but I, brewing a, say, a 1-gallon batch or a, actually 3 quarts or 3 liters um, is a lot quicker than doing a full-scale batch because, I mean, you still have to boil for an hour. You still have to mash for an hour. But getting that smaller volume of, of liquid up to strike water temperature and getting it up to boil and then chilling it down afterwards is just a fraction of the time. So that's <laughs> – I'll step off my, my soapbox and allow you to reply, kind sir. Yeah, if you uh, – especially if you're, if you're brewing on your stovetop, uh, scaling down is going to result in, in faster heating times. And, and also likely if you're using the same equipment, uh, quicker chilling times. So there can be a little bit of a, uh, um, yeah, a little bit of a time advantage to doing it that way. Definitely. And it's funny. I was thinking the other day of like, what would be the smallest setup that you could brew beer with? Like I was thinking if I went back to college, what could I do? And my idea was you could take like a small bag or maybe even a pantyhose if you didn't have it. Uh, mash in like a thermos and then boil your wort in a hot pot and then <laughs> ferment in like a two liter soda bottle. <laughs> if, if you needed to make like, you know, totally like super small, ga- you know, batch size and, and, you know, perhaps clandestine, which at my college I would have to have been. Uh, yeah. So you could, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things you could, well, Steve, uh, you could adapt to making very small batches if you wanted to. Steve Steve needed some wort to make a sauce for one of our videos, and he used a, a French press coffee maker uh, to do so. I have a pretty good-sized French press coffee maker, and I kind of stole that idea from uh, Casey Latillier uh, way back in the days. Uh, if people have listened to the Blind Mice Brew episode, he was making uh, all-grain starters uh, using a French press coffee maker. So... Uh, that may be a that that may be a fun like iron brewer challenge is to make you know one one uh, one bottle of beer one twelve ounce beer and see <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, you don't need a wort chiller when you're doing small batches you can just use an ice bath uh, in the sink um, you can ferment in uh, one gallon jugs that you get apple cider or whatever in. Uh, or you can you can use the uh, Mr. Beer uh, fermenters to to make better beer than what was intended <laughs> in those things. Uh, so it, it, I mean, brewing smaller uh, it allows you to more accessibility to equipment. Like if you're an extract brewer and you haven't uh, gone into all grain yet, um, you know, doing a one gallon batch where you actually do some mashing and some sparging. It, it familiarizes yourself. You can familiarize yourself with the concepts before you step up into, uh, you know, buying all the equipment to, to do larger batches. Um, and also, brewing small batches, you can experiment with uh, weird ingredients uh, and, and uh, interesting uh, techniques that you think may be risky on a larger scale. And that way, if they work out on a small scale, you can always scale it up. Yeah. One, uh, one scale I really like is, is two and a half to three gallons because I'll do a lot of those, uh, like partial mash on my, my stovetop when I don't feel like, you know, when it's a billion degrees in Texas and I don't want to go out, out on my porch, uh, I can do a two and a half or three gallon uh, stovetop beer, no problem. And uh, a nice thing is that uh, three gallon carbo, uh, yeah, three gallon carboys are are fairly common. And so you can either use them for if you're doing a two and a half gallon batch, you can use that as a primary, and um, you know you'll yield about a case of beer out of your brew day. Or if you if you have five gallon carboys, you can brew a three gallon batch. Use a you know, use the five gallon uh, carboy uh, for your primary, and if if you do secondaries, you can use a three gallon uh, for that, and um, you know that makes a little bit over a case. I forget it's like a case and a half or whatever, and that's that's a pretty nice size because you get uh, you know you get enough 
beer that you sort of feel like, yeah, that, that's, you know, uh, worth my time. And, you know, especially if you brew it at that scale, again, you're, uh, your, your heating and cooling is pretty quick. Uh, so the brew day is pretty fast. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, equipment that matches up with that size. Like there are three gallon corny kegs out there, hmm. which, uh, those are a little bit more expensive and harder to find, but, but those are, those are nice. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of weird size corny kegs too. There's a two and a half gallon size. Uh, I've seen a one gallon corny at one point. <laughs> um, yeah, look weird. Uh, cause those are all just, uh, those are, they have the same, uh, ends as a five gallon corny. They're just different the hmm. size of the cylinder. It's just different. So the one gallon corny was like this little squat, uh, thing that was kind of funny looking. And another nice thing about small batch brewing is there are, uh, there are a few different small kegging options out there. There's, I've never used it, but there's this thing called tap a draft that has like these big six liter bottles, uh, and supposedly sits in your fridge and runs off like the little paintball esque CO2. I don't think it's exactly the paintball grade CO2, but, uh, the food grade version of that, I'm guessing. And, uh, there's also those little five liter, uh, aluminum kegs that you see like, like Heineken comes in and, and, and some of the, some of those German brands, sometimes you see the big, uh, those, well, big or little, depending on what you're big compared to a bottle, <laughs> small compared to an actual keg, but lo- the five liter, uh, you know, and those, uh, if you make it a three gallon batch, two of those will, you know, uh, take all, but you know, the last liter of, uh, that. So there's, there's some nice packaging options too. And then of course, if, even if you do have just to go to, uh, 12 ounce bottles, well, you know, packaging a, a case or a case and a half is not not that tough. And talking of bottling, um, I get a lot of questions asking how do I how do I prime or carbonate uh, small batches, and uh, I use those little sugar tablets. Uh, there's Cooper's carbonation drops, which are these big kind of they look like hard candy, uh, and then there are these little uh, priming sugar tablets that are out there that I think they recommend using four per bottle. Uh, and that's a really easy way to prime, say, a six-pack or a nine-pack of beer. Um, and there is a they make a little uh, racking or auto siphon for small batches that makes uh, bottling pretty easy uh, using that. And I just hook up the auto siphon to a hose and run that down to uh, my wife, who is holding the bottling wand, uh, with the the hose attachment, and then uh, we just rack the rack the beer straight from the fermenter into the bottles, and then prime with those those uh, priming tablets, and, and it's easy. So let's talk about recipes. People ask all the time, you know, how do I scale up and how do I scale down a recipe that I've found on the internet? So you don't want to talk about your wife holding the hose? Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sorry. My junior high version of me just jumped out. <laughs> In other words, the regular version of you. The regular, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, what were we talking about? Scaling, Scaling the recipes. recipes themselves. I mean, how do you get from, say, if you find a a five gallon recipe and you want to make it into a ten gallon recipe, or or scale it down into like three quarts? How do you do that? Yeah. The nice thing about uh, scaling as long as you stay sort of within the, uh, uh, you know, volumes that a home brewer would reasonably make, you can pretty much scale everything linearly. Uh, you know, if you've got a five gallon recipe, uh, that you like and you need to make 10 gallons, just double all the ingredients, you know, uh, double all the malts, malt extract, uh, hops, and, you know, double the size of the, the yeast starter that you make. Um, and, you know, scaling down is the same. Just, uh, you know, if you're making a two and a half gallon batch, it'd be half as much as everything. Uh, if you if you drastically scale something, like I've heard that it, when people try to scale sort of homebrew sized batches or, you know, some breweries have a small, essentially a home brewery set up as a pilot system. I've heard that when you try to scale things way up, you sometimes have to fiddle with the hops a little bit, um, uh, basically to you need to adjust them downwards, but you know, scaling between if you scaled a three gallon batch to 15 gallons, you probably wouldn't, uh, or vice versa. 
you know, you probably wouldn't notice it because it's not that big of a, a difference. One thing that I've noticed when scaling down recipes, uh, I scale the, the ingredients proportionally and the times uh, stay the same as far as mashing and boil time. But the one thing that is fairly radically different is the evaporation rate. Because I, if you're boiling, uh, if you're wanting to get three quarts or three, well, well let's just say, say three units. <laughs> if you wanted to get three units, uh, well, let's say three quarts because it does count. If you're wanting to get, end up with three quarts or three liters approximately, you're going to have to start off with about five quarts or five liters because the boil off rate, you know, you're going to lose a couple of quarts during that hour of boiling. So the boil off rate is like, what, 40% for that small batch? So that's quite radically different from, uh, from a larger batch, which, you know, what, what do you, what's the usual boil off rate for, say, a five gallon batch? It sort of depends on, and people, it sometimes gets expressed as a percentage. And, you know, a lot of times you hear, uh, 10 to 15% mm -hmm. with 10% being sort of what a small like commercial brewery would, you know, at least in the old days uh, would have tried to achieve. Um, you know, as people also sometimes express it as, as a gallon uh, or a gallon or a gallon and a half per hour, which obviously would be independent of size. And, uh, but yeah, you, you definitely add on the stovetop, with the smaller volumes, you can definitely boil things way down. And uh, there's there's a couple solutions to that. One that 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 you you know hit on is just add more water to start with, so that mm -hmm. you start out dilute and and boil down to it. One thing I like to do, especially if you're brewing like three gallons on your stovetop, is um, bring the you know bring the wort up to about three gallons. Uh, you know, so if it's a partial mash, uh, that's possible. And then. Uh, just have a pot of boiling water sitting next to your your brew pot, and just keep the the wort topped up essentially at the same level. You know, like every ten or fifteen minutes, just uh, you know you'll you'll be able to see the ring of hop residue on your kettle and just bring it up to that. And then that's another easy way just to, to not you know start with like three gallons of wort that you think is going into a coal and end up with like one gallon of brown sludge and. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the the one good thing is that uh, you can also top up in the fermenter as well. If you if you come a little sh a little shy of what you want to have in your fermenter, uh, you know you can either get some boiled and chilled water or you can get some spring water from the store uh, and top up in the fermenter, and uh, you'll be good. It, it, it'll be kind of like doing a, a partial boil uh, in that way. But yeah, you know everybody's system is different, and everybody likes to boil it seems at, at at different vigors you know so your boil off rate is it may be di may be different from brewer to brewer and from system to system and from stove top to stove top so that's something that you kind of have to take notes in a logbook of some sort uh to keep track of what your boil off rate is for that particular batch so that you can compensate for it the next time yeah one thing you you always want to to try to boil your work fairly vigorously um and well, one nice thing when you when you talk about something like brewing one gallon batches, you know, even the the wimpiest home stove is probably you know you're going to be able to rock a boil mm -hmm. at that volume really easily. Uh, for larger volumes, though, on, on the stove top, you know, you get progressively to the point where the boil is less and less vigorous. And even even though in general boiling more wort is a good thing, you as you scale up from a tiny batch to a big batch and trying to do a full work boil, you need to sort of stop at the point where you're still boiling it fairly vigorously because if you don't, you're not going to get the uh, the kind of hot break or hot break that you want, and you, that could potentially lead to haze and, and instability in your beer. Um, so, and, and a couple, you can do a couple things to increase the amount of wort you can boil on your stovetop. One is to put the lid partially on. Mm. Uh, a lot of people advise against that uh, because if you were doing a uh, if you're doing an all grain batch and especially one with a lightly killed malt, uh, you can get DMS. Uh, 
coming out of the kettle, and if you have the lid on, it just condenses and then rolls back into your beer. Uh, the thing about if you're doing a beer with mostly extract, uh, all the DMS should have been blown off uh, when they boiled it and when they condensed it. Um, I mean, they're, it's given the way DMS works that some can come later. But the thing is, uh, as an extract brewer, you if you you know if you smell a cooked corn, uh, you know smell coming from your kettle, then yeah, open it up. But if you don't, uh, putting the lid on, you know, sort of cracked is going to uh, help you boil a little bit more volume. You can also, uh, they sell these little things, uh, I forget what they're called, but it's like a travel infusion tea makers, which are just basically uh, a little wire loop that you plug into the wall and it heats mm. up. And the idea is that if you're traveling, you put your tea in the uh, cup and then add the water and then heat it up and so it's sort of like a little low wattage immersion heater, and obviously this this doesn't make you able to to boil a ton more uh, of work. But what you can do is bring find the point in your uh, on your stovetop like what's the maximum amount you can boil pretty good, then add that so it sort of shift your kettle slightly off center and. Adding that will will heat the top a little bit, just enough that you get sort of like a rolling boil hmm. in there, which can help you a little bit. Um, and you know, you're maybe able to boil, you know, a, a cup or two more of wort, but it's <laughs> it, it it's more the where the heat is at that point, and getting the uh, getting the, the kettle to to sort of turn over, which otherwise you you know you'd sort of have to stir a lot to get. You sound like you're being attacked by cats. <laughs> I'm I'm always being attacked by cats. <laughs> now the uh a couple of things if you I mean if you be very very careful if you if you do try to put the lid partially on your stove because uh you can get a boil over a lot more easily that way. So you, you know a watched pot never boils but a watched pot you know seldom boils over uh, if you're careful. Um, and also, you can you can make a heat stick like uh, Jeff Karpinski talked about on the show and sent me, um, and that's made with a, uh, a a heating element from a um, from a water heater, an electric water heater on the end of it, and that really helps in uh, bring temperatures bringing temperatures up uh, more quickly. So there yeah, there, there the, are lots of interesting things that you can do to compensate. Yeah, the little tea thing I was talking about is basically a tinier version of. What what Jeff made the, you know, or or his is a bigger version. Of, <laughs> both of those are, both of those yeah. are true. <laughs> yeah. Because they're relative statements, both of those are true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you can yeah, and also putting on the lid, you also have to watch for steam a little bit too. You can actually, you know, just as when cooking, you know, if you pull a lid off of something, all of a sudden, even if it's you know not on one hundred percent, you can. If we're being safety conscious, <laughs> you can roast which we yourself. should be. Yeah. So there you go. It's, it, there's more information on those articles on beerandwinejournal.com, along with tons of other stuff that you're writing and you're you're posting. Uh, your stamina is is amazing, at least on the uh, on the writing side of things. Uh, you're keeping keeping the uh, keeping the goal up of posting almost every day. Uh, there, yeah. there have been some rare exceptions, but uh, it's good stuff, and we're getting more and more uh, readers to the site, and it's fun to uh, look on Google Analytics uh, every day and, and watch the little circles pop up of people all around the world reading, uh, reading the uh, site. So, good job, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, um, the site gets updated almost every day, like you say. Occasionally, uh, a weekend day will 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 pass by, but we've got, uh, right now we've got more articles posted than days have elapsed. So <laughs> we're, uh, at least on average, there's a post a day, although sometimes there's two on Monday, you know, without Sunday being posted or Saturday or, but it's close. There you go. All right, Chris, we appreciate it. We'll talk to you next time. Talk to you later. Well, thanks again to Chris. Check out beerandwinejournal.com. Tons of great stuff there and more being added every day. And there's even something for me every now and then, too. 
If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our Basic Brewing Growler bags are available on our shop. Protect your precious homebrew and craft beer as you take it from place to place. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. Our brewer's logbooks are on the store as well. Keep track of up to 50 batches of beer. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com, and if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks again to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Logitech Wireless Solar Keyboard K750 for Mac, Silver, and Gerber Baby Boys Newborn 3-Pack Short Sleeve Onesies brand Body Suits, Monkey, <laughs> Newborn. <laughs> Cute! Thanks again, everybody, and remember... I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly, greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Brew Your Own Magazine, BYO Magazine, through our associate links on basicbrewing.com as well. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dots. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.